Recording in progress.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I hope you all managed to take a good amount of time for lunch. I hope you did, um, you know, if you were carrying on with your neural networks, um, there will be some more time potentially to work on your neural networks later, so don't panic. But hopefully you've all had a bit of a break and you are feeling ready to deal with some explainable AI. Now, today is going to be quite a lecture heavy section. Um, I think hopefully this will be the right way to do it. Uh, this is also a brand new session. We did have a masterclass on one part of the explainable AI stuff we're going to talk about today run for the first time last year, but this session is quite new, um, so we will see how it goes. But I want to take the time to really give you a chance to understand what each of the explainable AI techniques are doing, uh, what the plots are doing. There's a little less time spent on the actual code because the code itself generally isn't too complex. We're bringing in some nice plotting functions that other people have created for us. It's more about understanding what the plots are telling you and understanding how you could translate that to stakeholders. So with all of that said, let's kick off. Or let's start playing the music again. There we go. So let's just take a step back and imagine. imagine that. That. Oh, sorry, got a bit of feedback there. Give me a second. There we go. Right. So let's take a step back and imagine that we have just finished building a model, the model we've been working on in all of these exercises, in fact, to predict whether patients should be given clot busting treatment or not. And when the treatment is administered, that can help to reduce disability or death. But there is a risk of negative outcomes of severe um, you know, damage to the individual patients if we give the treatment to a patient who isn't suitable. It's a very high stakes model in some ways. So we trained our XG boost model and we've told our stakeholders that it's actually really, really good. It's got good high accuracy precision recall. It's a really great model. But our stakeholders aren't convinced. They really want to know how it's coming to that conclusion. They want to understand what is going on. Why Why this patient? Why should we do this? What's, what's happening here? Well, we can tell them what went into the model. We can tell them that it tell it, we're using features like the time since the stroke occurred, that we're using the, um, the previous level of disability of the patients, the age, the gender, uh, what they ate for dinner yesterday, what day of the week they turned up on, does that day start with a T? So we've, we've thrown all of the data in there. And our stakeholders still aren't convinced. How is it coming to those conclusions? Does it combine those features in a certain way? How does it combine these features in each individual case to make a prediction for that patient in particular? What's it actually basing the prediction on? Is there some weird thing going on with the day of the week um, you know, that starts with a T? How, how on earth is it making these, these, um, these predictions and taking that forward? So we look at our amazing model. We've taken the data and there is this mysterious bit in the middle where a load of stuff happens. And then out the end, we have a prediction and it's a great prediction. We know it is. We've, we've trained it. We've looked at it. And our stakeholders are kind of looking back at us and we go, well, I don't really know what it's doing, but it's doing a really good job of it. We're HSMAs. We are not going to be happy enough with a good enough model. And we're also not going to be happy not being to, able to at least start to peel back the curtain of what on earth is going on. Now we want to be able to say, I can give you some insight into how the model makes its predictions. And with all the tools we'll teach you today, for any of the models we've worked on so far, you will be able to start doing that. Now, by the end of today, you'll be able to produce plots like this for global overviews of feature impact for any black box model that we've worked with. And you will be able to understand and explain exactly what this plot is doing and how to interpret it. You'll also be able to understand the impact of the features on an individual prediction for an individual patient, which can be a really powerful way of starting to tease apart what's happening, how the features interact, how your model is working um, at a really kind of intricate level. So to summarize all of what I've just said, why do we need explainable AI? We need to have that confidence in the model. We need to be able to trust the individual prediction. We need to be able to trust the model more widely. We need to be able to trust that when we actually take it beyond this training and testing data that we've got as well, that it is actually working on something that seems fairly sensible, that it is actually going to be able to work in the real world with new real data that we haven't seen before. We also want to have a chance to step back and look at anything that doesn't look quite right. Is it seemingly working with a bit of data that's kind of nonsense? Is it putting a lot of weight on one thing that we don't think actually makes a difference? Does it match up with our domain knowledge and our understanding of the problem itself? 
And we've already talked about things like accuracy and the limitations of them. We really want to be able to assess our models beyond these standard metrics. So all of the benefits being able to include um, building trust in the model's prediction with our stakeholders, can this help it get over the line into being um, into being something that can be put into practice, not just a theoretical prototype sitting on the shelf? Can we satisfy regulatory requirements when you start getting to models that do things like predict credit scores, whether people should be allowed to, uh, people should be given a credit card or a loan, etc. And particularly with the kind of situations you're working on with lots of medical data that has very real impacts on people's lives, then actually being able to satisfactorily explain how the model prediction is working, why it came up with its conclusion for this particular person is really important. As I say, you can also start to debug the model, understand what isn't quite working. Sometimes, you know, we've already seen some people turn around and say, I'm getting a model that's got a perfect, um, seems to have a perfect accuracy. What's going on here? Well, that's often been because there seems to be something else predictive in leaking into your data set that you've got a perfect feature that is somehow allowing the model to learn something perfectly, but actually maybe isn't um, going to be available in reality. So practical examples within healthcare and policing, if we've got models that predict if a mental health patient is ready for a less intensive type of support, if we get that wrong, people may be stepped down too early and severe consequences may take place. If we have models which look at whether an offender is likely to reoffend, again, if we if we get this wrong, if there is inherent bias that is leaking into our model, if there's something wrong with the way that our model is making its predictions, all of these things we talked about in Dan's AI um, ethics session, Again, we need to be able to understand why that is happening, whether a scan shows cancer or not. If this model is not picking up something important, is this really actually something that we can put into practice? Or even if it's not impacting individual patients in a way um, in a way that can cause damage in that sense, it may still be feeding into things that might lead to us spending huge amounts of money. It may affect the wider care someone has. It may affect staffing decisions and so on. So it's really vital that we can vet the models as best as possible, as best as the current techniques allow us to do so and build trust in them. So by this point, you're hopefully all feeling fairly familiar with how machine learning models are built. We've sourced our data. We've spent a lot of time cleaning it. We've spent a lot of time dealing with missing values, maybe creating extra features. This is all stuff we're going to go on to a bit more next week. But that's um, that first step. We've spent a long time making sure that our model has the data ready to go and that it's good data. We've then done our train test validate split or train validate test of split of data. We've trained the model with our training data. We used our validation set to tune the model's hyperparameters. We've assessed the model with the testing data, checked its accuracy, precision, recall, and we've deployed it. But can we really be sure that the model's seen every possible combination of value and features in the rest of the real world that's out there? Very likely not. So I think you are probably feeling that actually being able to explain how the model is working is valuable, particularly on the kind of problem you'd be facing. But what is explainability in the context we're talking about today? Whenever it comes to AI, when we're talking about explainability, we're kind of looking at how much each of our features, each of our columns, each of our values that we feed in are contributing to the output. How important is that feature in the model's prediction and what is it doing? What direction is it pushing our prediction in? Is it making it more likely that we're going to say yes or more likely that we're going to say no for a given model? So we actually dipped our toes into the world of model explainability all the way back in session 4B, when we were looking at logistic regression. We were examining the model coefficients, the weights of these models. And we were finding out there that not all features are equally important. We had, what we could see was it seemed like being male was very important to the final prediction and had a strongly negative effect on your likelihood of survival, the impact of your what class of passenger you were, your age. But as we got further down, things like your fare maybe didn't make have such an impact on what the prediction that came out was. And if you were working on the exercises last week around feature importance in the tree-based models, you may have already come across a couple of the feature importance plots we're going to be talking today. Talking about today, don't worry if you didn't get to that bit because we're going to go through them in full depth and a lot, give a, spend a lot more time talking than we were able to in that exercise. But that was just one of the extensions. So you may have dipped your toes in the world of feature explainability. This isn't, um, you know, 
it's not just some of the more advanced techniques we're going to talk about later. And that's important to remember. You want to have a wide range of ways of assessing its explainability and not become over-reliant on just one of them. And also we saw that we could plot decision trees. That's another way of peeling back the curtain on what's going on. But as you saw, the outputs aren't the most user-friendly. And given that decision trees are often outperformed by the random forest and boosted trees where these plots don't really work, they can be a nice way to start, but they probably aren't going to be the final bit of explainability that you are going to be using. The other thing about these methods is they're model specific. They're, um, they're not model agnostic. Model specific, they are tied to the model types that we are using. Were they that some of the techniques we're going to talk about in a bit model agnostic mean that you can plug in the same bit of code to multiple different models you could run a logistic regression you could run a decision tree you could run an xg boost and a neural network and with some caveats you could basically throw the same techniques at all of those models and get the same explainability outputs not so with the logistic regression stuff that we did with certain kinds of these feature explainability plots that we did and definitely not with the decision trees that we did and the other limitation of these is they give us a really nice high level overview as to what the model is doing as a whole, but it doesn't make it clear how this can vary on a case by case basis and just how important certain features can be in certain cases when they may not have a large overall impact on every single prediction. So we're going to talk now about a little bit about global and local and model specific versus model agnostic. I've already started to talk about that. So global explainability techniques are these high level ones. Local explainability techniques are these individual level predictions. Model specific techniques, the ones that apply to only a specific model, like those logistic regression ones, those tree based ones. Model agnostic, the ones that we can throw at any model and get the output of explainability that we're interested in. So as I say, model specific, they only work with these certain types of model. And there is this is because in some way they rely on the structure of the model itself, for how they can be calculated. Benefit of these is they are often faster to compute. There's a couple of examples that we will cover today. Mean decrease in impurity for feature importance. This is one we can use with our tree based models and coefficients. We've looked at these for logistic regression models, but if you're doing a linear regression model, you may also want to take a look at those. There are some other ones we won't cover today, like saliency maps and layer-wise relevance propagation for neural networks, but it's good to know they exist. Model agnostic techniques, so I say, can be applied to any type of model. Each model is effectively treated as a black box. All that these techniques need to be able to make um, an, an assessment of what matters and how the predictions are being made is they need to see the inputs and they need to see the outputs. They are flexible and they're consistent across the models that they are run on. Now, the ones we're going to talk about today are SHAP, permutation feature importance, partial dependence plots and individual conditional expectation. But there are loads more and more and more seem to be cropping up all the time. There is LIME, um, I'm not going to try and say the acronym because I've completely forgotten what it is. Um, accumulated local effects plots, um, all sorts of um, additional things like global surrogate models, um, anchors, counterfactual explanations. So I'm just giving you some of these on this slide so that you can go away and have a look into them if you want to find out more about the world of explainable AI. But the ones I've chosen today should give you a really good starting point. So as I say, these are the ones we are going to take a look at. And they are when we go to the global explainability techniques. So the feature importance methods like the, um, the tree based ones that I talked about. So um, we've got mean decrease in impurity and another tree based method that we're going to look at for high level um, understanding of the models what features are important overall to the model technique, to the model's predictions and partial dependence plots. We've also got the local explainability techniques. So these are the ones that allow try to explain why a model made a given prediction for one individual. These are the individual conditional expectation plots and SHAP. But both of those can also have um, important, um, can also help you to understand the global functioning of the model, the, the overall functioning of it for in, in general. Before I kick off any more talking about how everything's working, I want to spend a little bit time of time talking about causality and the importance of not falling into the trap of 
starting to talk about each of these features as causing things, as being the thing that you can definitely change to definitely have a positive impact on an output. So I think you will probably agree that these cats aren't causing these, uh, these indents. Um, this seems like a very obvious example, but it's so easy to start falling into the trap in your machine learning, uh, in your machine learning careers. So there are so many lovely, funny examples of this. You know, popularity of the first name Tyler correlates with Google searches for desktop background. Perfect. That looks like a really good pattern, doesn't it? And I think we could do an awful lot about, um, you know, to change the impact of Tyler to get Tyler back into the top um, top uh, names by actually making sure that people care about their desktop backgrounds again. No one's going to be saying that, but it's so easy, as I say, to start doing that with things, a stupid example like that, you can immediately see that there's no chance. But if we replace that with um, something like, you know, my um, kidney function levels and patient mortality, and they track perfectly, or some other, um, you know, vitamin B levels and patient mortality, something like that, there could be something else going on in between. So we have correlation where variables have some sort of statistical relationship to each other. We also have causality, oh, sorry, causation, the change in one variable actually being responsible for the change in another. And just having correlation is not enough to imply causation. We do need to work out separately whether there is a causal link. And today, all of the techniques we talk about are not doing that. So ice cream sales and shark attacks, another one, the confounding variable here, it's not that, you know, um, the ice cream sales are driving the shark attacks. It's not that the sharks are attracted to the, attracted to the ice cream. The confounding variable here is the temperature. People will be out buying ice cream and swimming in the sea. You know, there's there's something else going on between in between that is linking these two, um, these two things. Like I say, these are obviously daft, but during the pandemic, there was a study that showed promising results that high vitamin D levels were associated with lower COVID-19 infections and mortality. Vitamin D is important. It's got a known role in immune function. So this seems like it makes an awful lot of sense. We could should just give everyone some vitamin D and massively reduce the COVID-19 um, COVID uh, mortality. Perfect. But lots of follow-up studies showed that controlling for things like life expectancy in the countries that these um, observational studies were done on and redoing the analysis showed the impact of vitamin D to be non-significant. But it would be so easy to jump on that, to see this pattern and to do something with it. There might still be a role of it, but we need other techniques to really tease that out. In some areas, that might be scientific studies, randomised trials, um, you know, having large numbers of people taking a drug, not necessarily knowing what drug they are taking versus a placebo, to really actually start to understand the causal effect of an intervention, controlling for the randomness and having, um, not well, the control, controlling for, um, you know, not not finding yourself in a situation where you are attributing the change in something to something else that you can actually get to the point where you're fairly sure that the thing you are changing is what is actually causing the, the measured effect that you are seeing. That's not always feasible, obviously. There are some other ways that you can determine causality. We're not going to go into those now, um, but it is an area that's a big thing that people are interested in for explainable AI. As I say, it's so easy to fall into the trap of speaking about your outputs as though there is a causal relationship. And you just need to be so careful all the time to not start thinking or start communicating that the variables the model identifies as predictive are causal. And it's something that you will need to rein your stakeholders in from doing as well. You need to make sure that you don't let them start um, start talking in that way and start interpreting in that way. And that's part of your role as a modeler to really kind of get them understanding what these mean. Um, and I'm going to be guilty, I'm sure, a couple of times throughout this lecture of starting to speak about it in a way that suggests changing one thing will change another. It's it's something that's not easy to um, to to get out of the habit of doing, but just kind of have it in your mind all the time. As I say, there's a real explosion in how 
interested people are in causal AI. It feels like it's going to be the next big thing. It's going to be, it's the thing that Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, all of the big fan companies are investing heavily in. They are interested in what causal AI can do. It's currently kind of at the point of being, you know, investigated, worked on. It hasn't really made it into the mainstream yet. In the next probably two to five years, we're going to see a lot more talk of causal AI methods that can really help to start or will try to start teasing out these causal relationships. But for now, it's just on the horizon. But it is something that a lot of people are also starting to expect to use in the next couple of years. So, you you know, this time next year, there may be a causal AI um causal AI session, or there may be a causal AI masterclass that we run. Um, so do keep that in mind. So it kind of sounds like all of this stuff might be a little bit pointless. Like, why are we teaching you all this explained by AI if it doesn't actually tell us for sure what, you know, what we can change to make things better? It's still valuable for understanding how a model is making the predictions that it is making. So take a moment and let's move on to actually some of the techniques that we can use. I'm gonna start with a couple of different feature importance techniques. These are some of the ones that you may have already had some exposure to. So feature importance is basically a range of techniques to work out the importance of each feature, our independent variables, our column in our X table, our, you know, the things that we are feeding into our model, you know, the genre, the release year, um, that sort of thing. If we're predicting music taste, the sex, the age, the fare, the cabin. So which of these is important? Of the variables present, what's the model actually really relying on and what's it basically ignoring? What's it chucking away? 